From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. Today we're going to get a lesson in winter sowing, sowing seeds in fall and early winter outside in a protected spot, a sort of easy DIY home nursery for making more plants. What we'll learn to propagate that way are specifically seeds of native plants, both meadow perennials like asters and joe pieweed, and also various shrubs. My guest is Heather McCargo, who founded the nonprofit Wild Seed Project in Maine in 2014 and has been growing natives from seed for 35 years. More in a moment, but first this message. Underwriting support by Color Blends Wholesale Flower Bulbs, supplying landscape professionals and ambitious residential gardeners with new ideas and high quality flower bulbs for fall planting. Plant tulips, plant daffodils, plant color blends this fall. Available at colorblends.com. Native plants' wild populations have shrunk alarmingly in the 35 years that Heather McCargo has been propagating native plants. The mission of her main based nonprofit called Wild Seed Project is to inspire and teach more of us to grow natives and use them to repopulate the landscape, whether our home gardens or maybe a community project like at a park or school or beyond. Welcome, Heather. I'm so glad to be with you today to talk about this important topic. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah. So for some background, Wild Seed Project, I think it's a membership organization. It's a nonprofit. And the word rewilding comes up a lot on your website, wildseedproject.net. Explain it in that term to us just briefly. Okay, well, what most people don't realize is that all of our developed landscapes are um, severely depleted in natural processes from their lacking in the original native plants and then our planted landscapes. Most of the plants in those, you know, in gardens now are clones, so they don't have the wild traits and they don't reproduce um, because they're often cultivars, which are selections sometimes chosen because they have particular traits that humans like, like dwarfism or mutated flowers that have bigger or multiple petals, or they might be you know, double forms where they have no reproductive organs at all. And so we've lost those wild processes and rewilding is the movement to get restore both nature and the natural wild processes that plants and all the creatures that are dependent on them need. And so we, you know, the, the word actually first appeared in the 80s in the conservation movement and was focused on restoring the large carnivores, like the case in Yellowstone is very famous because when they brought the wolves back that had been extinct, the wild landscape quickly became much more diverse and healthy with a lot right. more life and native plants. Right. So, but at Wild Seed Project, we're trying to get people to restore this even in our own gardens and backyards. And so the having the seed, the genetically diverse, you know, seed of our local native plant is a crucial part to that movement. Right. And I've been a propagator, you know, my whole adult life. And there's a lot of myths and confusion about you know, the ability to sow, grow plants from seeds and some of the difficult to propagate wildflowers are what caused that. But we have lots of great native plants that are easy to grow from seeds. So we'll talk about some of those. Um, a lot of people ask me about winter sowing, you know, it's kind of become a thing. And a lot of plants winter sow themselves, <laughs> um, you know, kind of the seed falls in fall or winter onto the ground. And, and I know when we did, uh, we recently did, th and thank you for helping me with it, a New York Times um, garden column together uh, about sowing native wild uh, meadow perennials and so forth, sowing their seed. And you pointed out to me that, you know, between mice and birds and, and who knows what, um, a lot of seed that falls on the ground naturally doesn't necessarily turn into a plant, but we can control that a little better with some of our wild type um, plants and their seeds and propagate a lot more uh, per plant <laughs> per, per plant, I think, right? We can get it, we can get a lot better ratio than if the mice and the birds are eating it by following some of your winter sowing techniques. So what's the basic, 
idea, what, whatever plant we're working with, what's the basic setup that I would need to do this? Cause I don't just like throw them out in the middle of my backyard or anything. Yes. Well, you know, <laughs> your garden has so many weed seeds. So that's where I like to get people to sow the plants in pots or flats, or you could make a uh, growing bed where you, you know, you say you need a pot and anywhere from four inches to eight inches across, it can be plastic, it can be clay, you shouldn't use like a peat pot or one of the biodegradable ones, because these seedlings grow too slowly, they will degrade before, but so you need the pot, you need good organic compost based potting soil. And I like the compost in the potting soil because it's filled with different microorganisms, not just, you know, it's not sterile, right? You need a label and I like to use plastic or, you know, some sort of permanent label and mark it with a pencil, not a pen. Most of the magic marker pens don't last. And then you need coarse sand to cover the seeds with. Um, and you can, and the ideal time to do this is around the holidays, you know, oh. the, the Christmas New Year holiday, not, not before November, we, you know, you really need to wait till the cool weather sets in and with the climate change it keeps getting warmer and warmer in the fall. So you want to wait till um, all your other outdoor chores are done and then you can do it inside. Um, and so you fill the pot with potting soil, press it down. Um, firmly, you know, you can use the bottom of another pot to press it inside, and then you sow the seeds. And depending on the species, um, depends how much you will cover those seeds. And this is where the coarse sand comes in. It's a much better covering for seeds than more potting soil. And the reason is seeds need some light to germinate it. When you rototill your garden or dig in your garden, you bring up all these deep seeds from under the soil and that's why they all germinate. So covering with sand still lets light in and also it's coarse, sharp texture um, helps keep the seeds splash from splashing out in the rain. Uh events damping off. It really is a superior covering. And okay. really important thing is to cover each seed the correct depth. And a general rule of thumb is to cover the seeds to the depth of the thickness of the seed. So right. if it was an acorn, you'd bury them an inch. If it was a sunflower seed, you do about a quarter of an inch. And if it was a sesame seed, you do an eighth of an inch. And if it's a teeny dust-like seed, you barely cover them at all. Okay. So um, when we did the, as I said, the New York Times garden column, we really focused on the meadow perennials. And so, um, so let's sort of just get just for inspiration that people, because they have to collect the seed this fall, even though, as you said, it's more as we get toward the holiday period and so forth. And I think at Wild Seed Project, you do kind of a new year's sowing, almost a celebratory looking forward to the future kind of sowing. Um, but we, we, we would collect the seed as it ripens from perennials. And, and you mentioned so many in the arc, like penstemon, bee balms, asters, milkweeds. Ooh, so many others. Maybe you want to mention a few others, echinacea, rudbeckias. Um, I don't know. I have a whole list of them. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. Yes. And so the woody plants that are still being collected now are the dogwood, native dogwoods and viburnums. And they have a fleshy seed that's designed to be eaten by a bird. And you have to clean that flesh off, pretend you're a bird, remove it, and then, <laughs> and then sow them right away. Those seeds don't like to dry out. Okay. So now with the perennials, I'm going to interrupt for a second. It was with okay. the perennials. And there were lots of others like lobelias and iron weeds and Joe pie and, and uh, uh, golden oh, rods, of course, yeah. cardinal flower. Um, with those, you collect them as they ripen. And I believe you told me I should put them in like paper bags, properly labeled, and let them sit about a month in a cool place to kind of finish ripening before the late fall. So yes, so, so that, that's one thing sometimes people will, these seeds that need to dry out, which is a lot of the fall ones, they okay. need to air dry for a little while before sowing. And in the wild, they'd just be sitting on the stalk of the plant or maybe blowing around. They wouldn't be down in the wet soil right away. Mm. Um, so yes, that's important, which is again, why you can collect the different species throughout the fall and then hold on to them and then prepare, get all, while you're waiting to do your sewing, go get those supplies you need. 
Um, Cause it takes more time to go get those supplies than it does to actual do the actual seed sowing, <laughs> say, you know, between the Christmas and new year holiday. Okay. So the, the shrubs that you were going to mention, we yeah. don't, we pretend we're a bird or a, or a mouse. Yeah. So you chew off the flesh. <laughs> yeah. So, so many of them like the viburnums and dogwoods, and they're an example of one that those fruits you shouldn't let dry out. Most of the other ones, bayberry, wild rose, aronia, um, the yellow bush honeysuckles, the diervilla species, button bush, those seeds can, you still, um, you know, like with the wild rose that comes in a rose hip, you can actually let those dry and then break them apart with your thumb and get the seed out. But you can sow those seeds dry. Birches, you can collect those seeds. They disperse off a tree all through the fall and winter. They can be stored dry. Um, some of the ones that are better off not storing dry are witch hazel, which explode out of their pod, usually sometime in October and November, and they're little hard seeds. But those I like to sow right away. Or then the other common uh, woody plants that people know are the oaks and maples. And those mm. also have seeds that cannot dry out. Um, now you have a great complete on, on the wildseedproject.net. You have just because we can't cover everything, obviously, out loud in this short segment. You have great, very comprehensive, detailed um, explanations of how to do this for each one and which seeds fit into which category and can and can't dry out and so on and so forth. Um, so we're going to give links with the transcript to that great detail. This is a great reference site. You have a blog and you have some publications and lots of good stuff for people who want to dig even deeper into the particulars for uh, one species or another. Yes. And so again, especially for beginners, to change your thinking and think of cold weather, like you said, the holidays is a great time. That's the easiest time to sow most of the native species. And if you, you know, you need to be a little more knowledgeable to notice the seed ripening and harvesting. So if that's over your head, we sell wild seed project, sell seeds. And we yes. also have a source on our website of other great native nurseries where you can get native seeds, but yes, this is a thing, you know, a new way of gardening where you're restoring the native plants and you're sowing them, you know, in the late fall, early winter. And you don't have to worry, does that species need one month of cold? Does it need three months or five months of cold? If you sow them outdoors in the late fall, they'll all get that winter that they need and then they will germinate starting in the spring and some species will germinate as early as March, even when it's still regularly dipping below freezing, other species will wait till warmer weather of wow. May and June. So it's very variable and it's really interesting and fun to watch. But the important thing for those seeds is that they got to spend their winter outside. Right. So so let's let's visualize, like let's paint a, uh, a word picture of okay. this little nursery that we're creating. And so we talked about some of the equipment, so to speak. But one of the things that really appealed to me that I saw in uh, the pictures on your site and we talked about for the Times article, it, it seems to make it more doable and more controlled and like it's not going to go astray um, with some devious animal who's going to want to disturb all the pots, um, is to kind of put it inside a frame, almost like a raised bed frame or just a simple wooden, you know, four pieces of wood kind of thing, because we want to cover it with hardware cloth quarter or half inch mesh. We really want to cover it and weight that down with bricks, like really, really protect it from, uh, the would be nibblers. Right. So, yes. So let's talk a little bit more about, about it. it I mean, I feel like a frame would be a great thing and keep yes. me more organized. <laughs> yeah. So if you're handy and you can make yourself a wooden frame and then get the little hardware cloth to put on top and you can weight it down with bricks or you can make a real lid. You can also make a frame with cinder blocks. And again, put the heart, if you're, let's say you're not oh. handy with a, hammer and nails, you can just do cinder blocks, make a box and put the hardware oh. cloth above. It doesn't even hurt to put it underneath. The important thing about that frame that's different if you're an experienced vegetable grower is you want it in the shade for the germinating seedlings. Good point. And the reason is come spring, um, 
the sun can get hot and strong. And if you leave the house and go to work every day, you don't want those flats, ungerminated flats to dry out because a, ger a seedling once germination is a process. It's an, it's an event. It's not, you know, once it starts, you can't stop it. So once that seed starts to germinate, you don't want it to dry out. That will kill it. And so yes. having those undulated pots in the shade. Now, if you were growing something like butterfly milkweed, which is a plant that needs to grow in a sunny, dry site, once those pots have germinated, you want to find a shade, I mean, sunny spot to put them in. Okay. But for the ungerminated flats, them being in the shade, you know, is the best way to get the highest germination rate because then they won't have those swings of moisture level and you can have really hot, you know, most or all of the seeds will germinate. And so in those little pots, you can sow, you know, for instance, a package of our Wild Seed Project seed will have anywhere from 40 to 100 seeds in that package. You can sow that whole package in the little pot and cover it with sand. You know, native seeds are like, you know, teenagers, they like to grow closely together. They actually seem to, I, I can swear they germinate better when you have them all oh. close together. And then, <laughs> and then everybody's really tempted once they do germinate to quickly divide them up. Um, again, especially people who are experienced vegetable growers, these are not annuals, they're perennials, you know, whether they're herbaceous perennials or woody shrubs, you know, so they grow, they have a slower timetable and they don't like to be disturbed. So you can take that whole cluster of seedlings and put it in a much bigger pot to grow on through the summer. You know, you can divide them up earlier, you know, but you will disturb the roots. So you'll set their growth back. Um, right, right. Sure. You see, so that's the advantage of taking the whole clump of seedlings and just putting them in a much bigger pot and keeping them in your little nursery area all summer. It's not very hard to water a couple pots. And if you have them in a big pot, they won't dry out all the time versus planting them out in your garden in June or July. You know, unless you're the most attentive person in the world, you're going to, you know, either lose them to the weeds or other plants growing there because they're smaller. Yes, definitely. Well, and the, the thing that, you know, people might be thinking like, wait a minute, you mean they're out in the open and they're, you know, all winter long and whatever. And, but that's what breaks through the seed coat. That's what does the job that nature does, right? Is it, yeah. it gets them to germinate and they each, as you said before, they germinate in their own time, depending on the species and kind of how it's, constructed and, you know, it's its own timeline and it responds to those freezes and thaws and so forth. Um, and, and then boom, there it goes. Um, and then maybe uh, what you said, you know, we could transplant the entire clump into a larger pot, grow it on. And then maybe around the next fall when it's cooler and moisture again in the garden, would we plant those, maybe divide those up a little more and plant them around the garden? Is that when yes. you're ready? Yes, now's a great time to do it. Okay. And yes, no matter what the winter weather throws at these pots of seedlings, it can be 40 degrees and then it can dip down to 10 degrees that night and then get a foot of snow and then pouring rain, that freeze and thaw. These seeds don't mind that. They like it. They actually need it to break up their heavy seed coat. And it's what's really different about our you know, native plants, they haven't been domesticated, um, which one of the things of domestication is it tends to thin the seed coats. That's why your lettuce seedlings will all germinate quickly within a week. And if they haven't, they're dead. They, you know, that that time of cultivation over the centuries has thinned the seed coats so they germinate really quickly. But right. our plants don't have that and they need it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I don't yes, think don't you don't have to worry about the wet. I've I've had pots of seedlings germinate. Um, I've had um, trumpet honeysuckle germinate in late January in one of those weird winter thaws. And you know what? They I just left them, and they then it got cold many times and snowed and rained, and they were still fine come spring. Hmm. And probably in the wild, those seeds germinate kind of under, you know, their sort of woodland edge plant, um, 
under the litter and they've learned to germinate in the cool, cold weather of even winter, just the seed and will hang out till it's time to put on more growth. Huh. So in the last couple, three, four minutes, I want to talk about that. So we, the setup is the same for our, our DIY nursery and so forth. And we're going to protect everything and we're going to, um, fall, you know, top dress it with sand and so on and so forth. Do we sow the shrubs and the tree seeds as thickly as you were describing with the meadow seeds, or is there different spacing for those? Um, just- with the shrubs? Yes. I sow them thickly too. Okay. And obviously I do divide, but I can, same thing. You can grow them on the bayberry wild rose aroni. You can grow them on as a clump and then wait and divide them in September um, not the trees. Um, well, depend on the species. I sow my, um, for instance, my birch and maple trees also, you know, maybe a little cl- less close, maybe a half an inch apart. And I also wait to divide them up. They just do better if you let them grow together. And it's it's what often happens in the wild too. Not all of them then would make it to an adult, but you all your pot of seedlings can by separating them out. Hmm. Um, but you can, you know, a commercial nursery would sooner in the process um, divide up the seedlings to grow on, on, on into the pots. But as a home gardener, leaving them together as a clump and just keep moving them to bigger pots you will have more, they will grow faster because you won't have the root disturbance, which is, you know, they don't like that. Yeah. Um, So we should probably in the last minute or two, we should disclaim, we, we're not encouraging anyone. We're, 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 we are encouraging people to use wild type seed as close to the way nature made it as possible because of the things you talked about at the beginning, that some of the cultivated varieties have been tinkered with so much that they may even be sterile or not so good at being reproduced this way, but we're not saying to run around in, in, um, wild places and take seed because that's normally against the law to go on other people's property. Right. I mean, it needs to be ethically, ethically gathered seed with permission and and so forth or purchased as you say, correct? Yes. And I consider seed collecting like a farther down the journey of seed yes. sowing, yes. start sowing, you know, this year, unless you have something right out your back door in your yard um, or in a friend's yard, just start, you know, you need to, to collect wild seed. You need to properly identify it when it's in bloom. Most of these plants aren't in bloom anymore, except for the asters and goldenrod. So that's a little farther down the journey, but you can get okay. going right away. And then you can watch the whole life cycle of a plant. Um, and the baby seedlings can be quite cute. You know, it's <laughs> fun to see what they look like. And some look like exactly like, you know, have the just miniature versions of the same leaves and other have juvenile leaves that are quite different. So it's a really different way to interact with plants and participate in a different part of the life cycle that most people don't get to do anymore because they just think you buy plants all the time. Right, right. And I think that's a really important point to get to recognize the juvenile stage, the seedling stage of, of our important native plants, because Oops, so many times I bet we've weeded some of them out when in fact we could have transplanted them to somewhere where they could, you know, mature and thrive, right? Because we didn't know it was them. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Heather, I'm so excited about your work. And like I said, I've already learned so much in the website, wildseedproject.net. I mean, you have, uh, for instance, this publication, Native Trees for Northeast Landscapes, a wild seed project guide. Maybe we'll talk about that on a subsequent segment we'll do someday, but lots of Again, really strong resources and inspiration for people who want to learn. Um, and as you say, maybe by st- starting by but just buying some seed from you or one of your uh, recommended uh, suppliers and, and doing it this, this late fall, early winter and, and um, learn along the way from your website. So thank you so much for making time today. And now get back to your seed collecting. <laughs> I will. And thank you so much for this opportunity, Margaret. Okay. Talk to you soon again.
Goodbye. Underwriting support by Color Blends Wholesale Flower Bulbs, supplying landscape professionals and ambitious residential gardeners with new ideas and high quality flower bulbs for fall planting. Plant tulips, plant daffodils, plant color blends this fall. Available at colorblends.com. And I'll talk to all the rest of you soon again, too, I hope. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or on Facebook and on Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening and seed sowing meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.